Welcome to the Fortuna Ignite MBA prep course, uh, an exciting new development at Fortuna uh, that helps you candidates to the world's top business schools to put together irresistible applications. And uh, we're delighted that you can join us. Uh, many of you have taken the time uh, to fill out a lot of background details uh, for this session today. My name is Matt Simmons. I'm one of the co-directors at uh, Fortuna Admissions. I also, with Poets and Quants, uh, co-host the Centre Court uh, MBA Festival, where we sit down with the admissions directors and deans and students and career services from pretty much all of the world's uh, top business schools. We're delighted uh, that you can all be with us uh, today for this first session. Um, Fortuna, my enormous great fortune is to work with this dream team of former uh, associate deans, admissions directors, associate directors. I think we have 18 of the world's top 20 uh, business schools covered. You can see uh, the list from Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, through international schools like INSEAD, LBS, uh, the M7, and more. Um, and we are very fortunate to talk with you, the applicants to these top schools. Uh, we organize free consultations that we take very, very seriously. You won't be filling in quite the level of detail of the strategy questionnaire that we sent you for today's session, uh, but we really take the time to look through your profiles, to discuss with you uh, your background, your experience, your accomplishments, your goals, uh, and uh, help you uh, for the next steps applying to business school. I mentioned uh, the dream team. Here are uh, a number of them that are joining us for this Ignite session today. Uh, it's lovely to have Michelle Belden. Uh, Michelle, uh, one of our senior expert coaches, who was uh, a former associate director of admissions at Wharton. Uh, moving to the Midwest, Patty Keegan, uh, again, another of our senior expert coaches, who was a former associate dean at Chicago Booth and also on the adcoms at Stanford GSB. And then all the way uh, to the West Coast, uh, Peter Johnson, uh, a great friend and senior expert coach at Fortuna who was uh, at Berkeley Haas. He was the former assistant dean for the full-time MBA program and admissions. And my co-director at Fortuna, uh, Judith Hadara, who, who was uh, the former admissions director at Wharton. So you can imagine with that level of experience, what we're looking and hoping to share with you uh, in the next hour as we think about uh, next steps. Uh, Fortuna Ignite uh, is a program that will over six weekly sessions um, bring you all of that expertise and the ins and outs of each step on the path to business school. Uh, so whether you're thinking about how you stand out in a well-represented pool, how you tackle those why an MBA and share those post-MBA career visions, letters of recommendation, interviews, each of the steps of the way the Ignite program has you covered. And the idea today was to give you a taste of Fortuna Ignite. Typically, these are courses that run in small groups, five, six, seven people. Uh, obviously, there are many more of you that are joining us today. Um, so we're going to take one of those themes, and we're going to be looking very specifically at the idea of a career vision. And of course, so many of the business schools ask you uh, what your plans would be once you finish their MBA program. Columbia, super specific. You know, you're at point A, you want to get to point B, and how Columbia is going to help you get there. Um, actually, Harvard is probably the only one that doesn't ask why you want to go to Harvard Business School. So the first challenge that I've set to the team and the many, many years of admissions experience uh, that they have was to imagine that they then attended a five year, perhaps a 10 year alumni reunion of individuals that they were admitting to Haas or to Wharton or to Booth or to Stanford all those years ago. Um, now, Patty, if you were in that crowd and you said to individuals, what are you doing now? What sort of responses do you think you'd get from the Booth and uh, Stanford graduates? I'd say fairly, fairly straight on um, with their ambitions, uh, with their goals, maybe not exactly, but certainly within the realm of uh, what they told us. Um, not in sometimes you get someone who's doing something completely different, maybe in the entrepreneurial arena. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, when you go through applying to a uh, top business school in particular, really put a lot of thought into your career strategy. And so I'd say those folks that I see at those reunions are for the most part following 
um, what they've told us on the application end, with a few exceptions. Now, if they're playing background music, Pete, at this event, and it's like, oh, that's a really great song. Oh, who's it by? And I hold up my phone and I turn on Shazam and instantly I'll get the response. Now, why, why do I give you that as an example? Yes, well, Matt, thank you for that. Um, actually, Matt's referring to a story that I told him about a couple of alumni who wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but thought that they would go into consulting immediately after business school. And instead, they ended up pursuing their entrepreneurial dream, which was to create a product that became Shazam, uh, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, I think they were surprised more than I was that they ended up doing that immediately after business school. But one of the points that I would make for everyone who's thinking about their career goal, um, at the 10-year alumni reunion, I feel like maybe 40% of the people have actually ended up doing what they thought they were going to do pre-MBA. And that's for two reasons, not because they were dishonest. Uh, in many cases, it's because they realize their post-MBA goal and within the subsequent 10 years have moved on to something else. Um, the other reason is that an MBA program is a tremendous learning experience. And I would guess that for every person who enters, you will learn about five career options that you never even considered pre-MBA. And so sometimes something that you're not thinking about now becomes even more attractive. And you know what? That's okay because none of us are going to come back to you at that 10 year reunion and say, you lied to me. You told me you were going to be an entrepreneur and you became a banker. So it's more important for you to have a sense of the direction that you're going. Now, if we're going to take bets on this, Judith, we could probably make a lot of money. But Pete reckoned maybe 40% <laughs> actually ended up doing uh, what they said in the application. How, how does that number compare at Wharton? Oh, 100%. Uh, 100 I would take that bet. Um, famously, our dean, at, our associate dean would say at the, at the welcome event and then at the graduation event, like, I would be a rich man pretty much if I was taking bets on who was actually doing what they said they were going to do in their application. And I think it refers a lot to this incredible opportunity to look at what are the possibilities, right? You come in with one set of ideas, a lot like undergrad, and then you leave totally going in a different direction, possibly in something you didn't consider. Um, and, I, and I think that that's the beauty of this two-year experience. And if I can segue into it, that's why this process is so good because you're really starting to think through the things that matter to you. And you may come in with a set of priorities and a set of values that are then influenced and developed and encouraged by people that you're in school with. So um, I'm, I'm not surprised that there's a lot of differential between um, students coming in and students going out, but I think it's because of that really, really important evolution. Now, now the idea of um, how you can use business, business school to pivot, uh, to accelerate, you know, all of the different options that, that you've each described, and of course, where business school and a particular MBA program fits in the plan. I think, uh, Michelle, that speaks to something that you feel very strongly when you're working with candidates through the Ignite program or in the one-on-one -on -one coaching that you provide. Uh, this fundamental question about why. Talk us through that. Yeah, I think as all of us as coaches, as we begin with our clients and talk about what are your goals, right? After business school, you know, long-term dream jobs as Columbia states in their prompts is to really kind of peel back the understanding of the why behind it. it, it I think it's just as important as the goals themselves because for us, it's really to understand your motivations, right? And why is this meaningful to you, important to you, you know? So to really, I think for the admissions community to understand why do you wanna pursue these goals? So the why behind it, like we say, what gets you up in the morning? You know, what is what are you really drawn to? What, you know, what are the problems that you're eager to solve? So really talking through with our clients and getting that understanding, you know, to help develop that career vision statement it is, is really important and key. So to understand, to talk about what has been your background, you know, your experiences in that context and how that's provided and informed your goals, right? That foundation, what is the impact you wanna make? So starting there is really key to this process, I believe. And I think as we all work with our clients and through Ignite, when we first start here with the career vision is to take that step back and 
you understand what is it that you want to do? You know, what's your sense of purpose? You know, I think these schools really want that clarity because as we just talked about, you might end up taking a different path, but ultimately you understand where your interests lie. So I think, you know, if that is ultimately to be the entrepreneur, you know, is what's the, is that is that the first step? Is is that your your end goal? And what does that look like and feel like for you particularly? So and it's connecting all the dots. Where have you been? Who are you now? And where do you see yourself going? We sometimes have the issue, uh, Michelle, you know, clients um, that say, well, you know, I, I do want to move into consulting. It feels like the right next step, but isn't that good? But that's okay. Yeah, I, you broke up a little bit, but I think going into consulting, right? Like, and you're not quite sure, is that okay to say? Is it interesting? I'm going to be put in a big bucket. And for me, I, I push my clients. When I say push them, I, I make them go do their homework. I'm like, what is it about consulting that pulls you to it? What do you believe the skills that you're going to develop there? You know, the knowledge, is that a stepping stone or is that ultimately something that you just really feel that is a good fit for you? And though, again, the why behind it. And you have to be able to tell that story in your essays, in your application. And again, that you're connecting it to what you've done. And again, transferable skills from your past jobs that will really, you know, you know, prepare you again, along with the MBA to then take that next step into consulting. So, you know, when I, I ask my clients to go, you know, go talk to current consultants, friends, reach out to the business schools, to the consulting club. There's a lot of homework you can do in that space to again, really develop your story so that it's compelling and, you know, realistic and being like, oh, I, and, and understanding again, the motivation behind that move into consulting and what that looks like and feels like specifically again for you. Now, now, all of those on the screen, consulting, banking, uh, working perhaps in a product manager role in, in tech, I mean, these are all major recruiters from the top business schools. And so starting with the big picture and then digging deeper, you know, Pete, uh, you gave the example working with a client that stated, you know, I want to be a, an entrepreneur, but how did you then work together to explore, you know, next steps and what that might truly mean to this person? Well, I think one of the key things to think about as an applicant is, as uh, Michelle Ray mentioned, to know why you want to do something and to think about how a particular school might help you to achieve that goal. Um, that's important, but to just say, I want to be an entrepreneur uh, isn't a very compelling uh, response for most of the schools because I think in most of our experience, the people who are successful entrepreneurs are people who are passionate about something. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, I would push a client to say, what is it that you're passionate? What's the, the problem, the societal problem, the business problem that you want to solve? What is it that, that makes you want to be an entrepreneur just beside, oh, I can plan my own schedule and make a lot of money? Uh, I think there has to be something more to that response. And so I push people to think deeply about what they're passionate about and how they're going to use the business school experience and their career as an entrepreneur to solve those problems. Right. And we'll be looking through this session today, uh, the rewards of all of that reflection and, and introspection, you know, to really uh, anchor this um, thinking around uh, where business school fits in you know nobody has to go to business school to make a success of their career um, and right. the idea with ignite is that we're then looking at your stories your profiles and, and judith we have um we have drew so drew uh is an investment banker let's see he's worked at citibank uh, in new york um studied uh, economics at yale strong test scores or so solid test scores i'd say certainly very strong uh, gpa from a from a great school um, and is looking to make the transition, wants to get into private equity, and is a specific, perhaps in the focus of that. When you'd look at this, Judith, at, at, at a, a candidate at, at Wharton, are you just within the admissions office, or do you even then get the input of colleagues from career services to say, you know, here's Drew's story, is, is, is this a, a coherent and viable next step? Yeah, I will agree that we knew the folks in career management really, really well. Um, and career support. I forget what it's being called now, sorry. But um, definitely a, co a, co a collaboration is what this person wants to do viable. 
And if so, what are the steps to get there slash does this person understand those steps, right? You're not going to snap your fingers and all of a sudden, you know, be in the position that you want to be in. It's going to take it. It may take some time, but looking at this, I would have, I would have said to career services, I'm really interested in this person. I think that this is viable, but can we talk about it? Um, because the specificity of the tech media piece, I am assuming that he also did some of that at Citibank. Um, and I would love in the, in the work that this student is presenting to understand what's really drawing him to that specific niche. And I'm gonna steal a little bit of Michelle's thunder, but he is gonna have to tell us exactly what kind of organization he would like to be with. Like, does he know who's in this space and does he know how to get there? So that's gonna be, and that's something that Michelle talks a lot about with her clients, like give me a name, at least two names. Um, and so that's something that I would be looking for with this student. So, so in, in that case, being that specific and, and maybe a role, uh, a particular, not just one, but perhaps two or three companies in, uh, in the sector that they would imagine transitioning, coming out of Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, one of the M7 schools? Definitely. I think that the competition for PE in particular is incredibly strong. And so the clarity of your interest in the field is going to be in, in very important. So it's, it seems as if it's, oh, sure, I've done banking. I'm going to go to PE. It's not that straightforward. And the more that a student can show that the student understands what that looks like and how to get there and what kinds of you know, um, steps and, and engagement in class and outside of class and networking that you're able to do, these are all going to be important parts of it. Um, so I think that Drew is viable for PE, but I think that Drew is going to have to really prove it. Um, the way that anybody that's entering such a rarefied, you know, if you could look at all the possible post MBA careers, PE is very highly sought after, as a lot of the folks that are watching this uh, presentation understand. And so that's why we would push through to be super clear, understand the premise, and then talk to us about the path that he's going to use to get there. Now, Patty, the idea, I guess in Drew's case, he graduated from Yale two years ago. So uh, imagine he's perhaps 24, 25, uh, as he would start business school. Uh, and there are different ranges, you know, of, of um, ages of, of candidates. When you're looking at, at an applicant, um, here's the example of a 32-year-old looking, mm -hmm. again, to make a transition. They're looking at McKinsey, Bain, BCG, or investment banking, or Drew's route uh, into private equity. What's then going through your head as you think about someone at that stage of their career talking about a typically a transition to like a level two associate position in one of those companies? Right. I think what we have here on the slide, coherent and achievable, both are really important. So it's important for the applicant to put together a, a coherent plan. But a really important thing is, is it achievable given their background? Right. Mm -hmm. So business schools are in the business of wanting to help their students. They want to be successful, but they also want to make sure the people they're bringing into their classes that they, they can help, that there's a path there. So this 32 year old who wants to make this transition, I would want to see the steps he or she has taken um, to get to that point. And then I would sit down, as Judith said, with my career services colleagues. And I would talk about, is this even achievable? Does this person, has this person done his or her research? Are companies interested in someone with that background coming in at a certain level in the organization? So when we say achievable, it isn't just, I have great grades, I have a great GPA, I'm gonna you know, really kill it in business school. We also need to keep in mind that um, industries play a huge part in this. Are they interested in someone at a certain level of expertise to come in at a particular level within that industry or within that organization. So coherent and achievable is really important when um, I'm working, when we're working with clients to set their goals. Um, and it's important, again, I can't stress enough, um, going back to Judith, that EdComs uh, sit with their counterparts in career services to make sure that applicants' goals and plans are achievable and they, they make sense, and that uh, particular company or industry is open to bringing somebody on with that experience. Right. 
Uh, Mich Michelle, you, you're on the West Coast, uh, so is Hollywood. Uh, I'm thinking of our Fortuna colleague, Jessica, who of course spent 10, 11 years in very senior admissions roles at USC Marshall uh, and then at UCLA, UCLA Anderson. And Jess Jessica often says, you know, people would look at those two schools imagining that they would be the natural springboard to a career in Hollywood. We see the same thing with some of the top French schools like INSEAD or HEC. You know, these must be the pipeline to the big luxury groups like LVMH. Um, but it's not always so straightforward, right? I mean, the, those are, the, are those companies actually coming to business schools to hire MBA grads? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the first question the applicants need to ask themselves and go do their research. And going right to the career management centers, they provide the companies that are hiring from their schools, even sometimes how many they're hiring, as well as industry. So I think that's the first step. So going to a UCLA Anderson right here where I live in LA, are the companies, are the movie studios, you know, what, what is it within media and entertainment you're interested in? And are they actually hiring MBAs from, again, that particular school? I'll go back to my school, Wharton, strong media and tech um, club, network. They did treks to the West Coast. Those, those, those um, students were getting jobs. Again, but what companies? And, and so you reaching out, again, to the clubs at those schools, talking to the current students, is it really, again, going back to achievable and realistic? Right. So, again, there's a lot of work on your end to do. And obviously, I think there are those opportunities out there, but then it's finding going back to the right fit and the school for you, given your focus, your goals, that industry, going back to LVMH fashion. I go back to Wharton, very strong fashion retail you know, space, um, classes, clubs, opportunities. But you need to go find what that looks like. And again, career management services, those reports that they put out every year are a great um, place to start, even with consulting, knowing what companies are hiring from these schools is it really gives you, it's really informational to help you start that process and start those discussions. And again, is that school of the right fit for you as well? So I think that's just as important as your goals, as the whys is, and why an MBA, but is that the right school for many different reasons, but specifically for your career aspirations to be, to, to achieve those. Right. So before any of you imagine rubbing shoulders with Brad Pitt or looking at the spring collection at Christian Dior, for all we know, uh, the positions that might be on offer are for financial controllers and not in that creative space. So uh, Gabriel, uh, in signing up for Ignite, uh, shared his profile. It was absolutely fascinating to look at uh, what he's uh, what he's done, uh, targeting a number of the M7 schools. His career in Brazil, after he graduated from engineering, he went back to school much later for mathematics, actually spent some of his studies in France, uh, started with Deloitte, uh, and now in a senior data scientist role at uh, Itaú, uh, thinking about McKinsey, Bain, and uh, BCG uh, as he would go to business school. Again, uh, engineering, I think he's got eight years of experience, and I estimated, Gabrielle, that you're probably now 32, um, still got a GMAT or a GRE ahead of you, and had done some fascinating work in robotics, I think, during your undergrad studies. Um, now, here's an example, regionally, Latin America and a search for talent. Is that something that Gabrielle could play on? And I open that question out to any of you to say, okay, you might not get hired in the Chicago office of McKinsey, Bain or BCG, but bringing those skills back to the Latin American market, um, you know, where they're really looking for these skill sets. Who, who wants to share a few thoughts about uh, Gabrielle and how he's going to converge his tech and engineering background with his next steps in business? One of the first things that I would do is I would really, uh, I, was re I would really focus on some of the other things that Gabrielle has done in terms of the extracurricular volunteer. I always like to unpack those extracurriculars with clients because very often that's where a lot of those pieces fall. Those pieces of the story come in um, things that somebody does outside of the office. So that's one of the first things I noticed about this profile is I'd like to know a little bit more about what Gabrielle is doing and computer skills for kids. What does that mean? I would unpack that first and see if there was something that we could work with there um, that, that would speak to the, to the combination of tech and business. 
um, that Gabrielle would like to move into. And, and so, I mean, robotics, or perhaps today, if you have uh, real industry knowledge in areas of machine learning and AI, could that then sort of compensate? And for the likes of MBB, uh, Patty, they'd say, you know, there's, there's such a great skill set that you have. Okay, you'll be graduating when you're 33, 34, but that would make sense to us because of the background that you have. Yeah, again, getting back to those the pieces of the story, how you're going to, how you're going to get from where you are now to that aspirational job, the short, we're gonna talk a little bit about short-term and long-term goals in a little bit, I know, um, but, but finding those little pieces, those little crumbs along the way, those experiences where we can tell a coherent story together for, for the admissions committees and for the school of, of your choice. Now telling stories, Pete, um, my memory, of you sitting down every year for your annual review with Rich Lyons, the Dean at Berkeley Haas. Um, and Rich, having worked with you on the pillars of, of Haas, I, I remember there being four, I'm not sure if I'm right in having shared. Uh, yeah, it's four, I apologize for the mistake on the screen. Um, and you know, when we talk about being a forever student or challenging the status quo, and you said, you know, that was a question we'd consider for students, but it's a question that I faced in my annual review. How had I? challenged the status quo. So Haas is really living those values. But I think on this slide, we wanted to capture maybe not falling into the trap or the pitfall of, oh, what am I supposed to say? Or what does the school want to hear? Can you talk us through this? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think that's a an excellent point, Matt. Um, there's a delicate balance as you, as a candidate, as you're looking at programs, there's a delicate balance between uh, demonstrating how a particular school is the right fit for your career goals. There's also the importance of showing that you as a candidate or as a student will bring something to the program that will benefit others. And what all of us have seen at various points on the admission side is some candidates who try too hard you know, and literally write an essay where they, for example, for Haas, where they go through the four defining leadership principles in a way that comes across as being very inauthentic and, and formulaic. Um, it's important to understand why, in that case, the culture of the defining leadership principles resonates with you and how it, how you reflect those things or how you're interested in diving into them deeper without just sounding like you're speaking to what you think the admissions committee wants to hear. And the other thing is I can guarantee that whatever someone on the outside probably thinks the admissions committee wants to hear is not going to be actually what they're looking for. Um, and another thing that I wanted to uh, mention also in reference to the last profile we looked at is it's, and Patty mentioned this in a, in a very good way, Remember, regardless of what your career goals are, most top MBA programs are looking for development of leadership skills. And in many kinds of careers, you may not have a workplace leadership role, but often the way that you can demonstrate how you develop those skills comes through your extracurriculars. And I think Matt and I were discussing a candidate that I worked with previously who, um, had his first draft of his career related essays that really didn't resonate very well. And part of it was that this person was unable to really demonstrate how they had been a leader or developed leadership skills. And in digging through this person's background, talking about their extracurriculars, I learned that he had been a volunteer firefighter and had actually started a program to recruit other volunteer firefighters. And uh, I was very surprised. I said, well, tell me more about that. And the whole story was actually very compelling, but he hadn't planned to say anything about it in his application, assuming that it wasn't of interest to the school and didn't demonstrate something that he wanted them to know. So uh, I think treading the fine line between uh, presenting yourself authentically and why a school connects with you um, also sharing those experiences that are not necessarily only in the workplace. And then finally, not uh, 
giving the stereotypical answer, you know, I want to go to school X because, and then the litany of things that you read on the website. That's not a good strategy. And all of us have seen it. Now, there are more pointed examples. If we go back three, four years, uh, we remember um, Columbia Business School had this video that, that you were required to watch. Uh, Judith, do you remember the music? Uh, you know, that was that was when I grown. But uh, you know, very quickly it appears on the stage, uh, on the on the screen, uh, New York, the heart of business, and you know, for Columbia, clearly uh, very important. So that would be a case of of addressing you know, Columbia's location, perhaps how it leverages a city like New York. Would you also want the candidate, therefore, to leverage New York from the career perspective? I definitely would think that that would be important, um, very specific to the candidate as an individual. I would not necessarily go on and on and on about restaurants and nightlife and Broadway shows because everybody who goes to Columbia thinks they're going to be seeing like seven Broadway shows a week. Doesn't really happen because you're going to be kind of busy. Um, but I think that when you do talk about a place geographically or an urban setting or a, you know whatever setting you, you're talking about, you want to really bring it back to yourself. So instead of like listing, 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 find the two or three things that are incredibly relevant to you and your candidacy. So that to me brings in um, the authenticity that I, that I think all these schools are really going to be looking for. Right. So I'm going to bring in Charlotte, who I've de described as the strategist. Um, and as, as, you, as we look through her profile, I, I'm just recalling from a center court event and I'm <clears throat> hosting uh, Kirsten Moss, then the uh, admissions director at Stanford. Kirsten and her team, of course, read uh, many thousands of applications every year, uh, and they have this famous tagline mission statement. I'm never quite sure how to describe it about you know, change lives, change organizations, change the world. And after reading so many thousands of these applications at Kirsten uh, at the Center Court Festival, she said, you know, lots of you, you're all smart. You've got great GPAs, strong test scores. You're in this fast track of professional development, but it feels that you've looked at that statement and you're like, ah, oh, change the world. What do I need to tell Stanford or indeed any school? And you start to give us this big vision about eradicating global poverty and uh, dealing with clean drinking water solutions in sub-Saharan Africa, which of course, if you could achieve any small part of that would be phenomenal. But she said, you know, we're detectives. If we then look through the resume and your career background and we don't see clean drinking water or some activism for socioeconomic justice, it starts to look very hollow. So um, here's Charlotte, who, again, targeting great schools on the East and the West Coasts. Uh, she uh, studied uh, political science and business at Brown, graduated uh, four years ago and another strong uh, GPA, uh, has always done peer uh, mentoring and then this fascinating experience that she had um, teaching in an orphanage in Tanzania. She's also got time working on U.S. foreign policy. Heaven knows the country needs it. Um, her career background, uh, working with uh, the CEB, uh, again, that research piece, and Gardner. So she's talking about a transition to strategy and development and targeting schools like Fuqua, uh, Stern, we're back to New York again, Stanford and Haas with their for leadership values or changing lives and changing the world. Michelle, as you look at Charlotte's profile, the advice that you'd give her, do, does she need to keep talking about team for, for Fuqua? Does she need to talk about changing lives and changing the world for Stanford? Well, I think she definitely has to, we'll start with Stanford, right? I, I, I use that tagline all the time with my clients who we discuss Stanford. Um, it's core to who they are. So you have to understand that they're definitely looking for students that align with that. But like you said, they're not looking for the, the big, big dream. They, they want to be both ambitious, right, and achievable. But it is, you know, with who Stanford is and where they're located and how, again, that's a good fit for you. And, and again, to do your research and outreach to alumni and students to understand how that aligns with who you are and again, what you want to transition to or achieve and what that looks like and feels like for you. So having those discussions with my clients is key to understanding the fit with Stanford and how to articulate that through their, their application. Um, and I think it's really, again, like you said, you don't have to, she doesn't have to 
go back to Tanzania and do X, Y, and Z, but ultimately what is it that really drives her, right? And you know, what is the impact she wants to make? What, we talk, what's the, who, what kind of leader does she wanna be? Um, and again, in, in what space? So looking, going to CPG, amazing. Okay, what, why? What, what is going on within that space that you wanna be part of their strategy and development team, right? And ultimately what will that lead to? So that's the going back to change lives, change organizations, change the world. How does your, within C, you know, how does that look like and feel like for you? And obviously Stanford SAB, you know, and why Stanford? So to be able to articulate why that's a good fit and what you will, how you'll optimize their opportunities that they offer at their school. Absolutely team, Duke, you know, we love, we all love their list of 25 things about you. You know, they really want to get to know you both professionally and personally. They are, that's what their culture is. They want to see, you know, who you are, what, you know, your personality, and, and that's important to them. And that's why they have had that, you know, essay question for a very long time now. Um, so I think each of these, you know, um, applicants that we're looking at in the schools, there's there hopefully is something that pulls them to those schools. And then knowing with their coach and, you know, the strategy of how do we help you shine within your team aspect and skills, your, your global background, your, maybe you're interested in global issues. What does that look like? You want to be a global leader, right? And some of the schools I'll say, you know, um, maybe more so with Stanford, right? You can bring that into your story and that's really attractive. And what does that look like and feel like from you given your past experiences? Now, both you and uh, Pete, uh, Michelle, have, have talked about leadership and, and you know, where it's embedded uh, in the, the, the personal and professional journey that is the uh, MBA. Uh, Patty, just, just one question that I'd have. You know, a school like Stern places a lot of focus on EQ uh, as well as IQ. Uh, we talked about Team Fuqua and, and both the GSB and Haas. You know, th these are schools that place tremendous emphasis on collaborative leadership team leadership and in Charlotte's case she hasn't said that she wants to be the CEO of a CPG firm her first step was to say in working in strategy and development do you like the pace of how she's uh, you know sort of r rather than someone turning to you and saying I want to be a CEO yeah I would want to know getting back to that major question why do you want to be a CEO right you have to have a reason for it I think one of the other things that um, that that I I tend to emphasize with my clients, getting back to that collaborative nature, business schools are looking at uh, putting together a community of students, a, a, a cohort of students. They're they're building a community. They're building their community each and every year. They're bringing in uh, students, and so making sure that our applicants remember that particular piece and really pushing them to figure out what they bring to the table in terms mm -hmm. of collaboration, what they're going to bring to the Stern community, what they're gonna to bring to the Stanford community is really important. Um, and so I don't wanna, you know, your example of, you know, Charlotte doesn't say I want to be CEO. Maybe she does down the road, um, but I would wanna unpack each and every kind of step with her to make sure that her story is being authentic as she's putting her application forward to these to these different schools. But keeping, you know, keeping your eye on community and what that means and collaboration and what that means, that's really important for business schools too. They're building their brand, they're building their communities. And um, I tend to always, you know, turn the conversation back with my clients to what are you going to bring to these schools? You know, what are you going to bring to your fellow students? Yeah. Well, uh, this idea of, of what you bring, uh, and it can be revealed, Judith, in so many different ways, uh, uh, revealing, right? You as admissions officers want want the candidate to reveal so that you can better uh, understand. And you can look in many places, not perhaps just at work, but, but think about characteristics. Talk us through how a candidate can really shine and bring these things to the surface. Sure. I really think that in the scope of the application, there's so many places to talk about what matters to you and where your strengths are. So a lot of people will look directly to the essays as an opportunity to, to talk about themselves, but there's so many other pieces within the framework of the application. You know, we, we can't forget the letters of recommendation as well, where individuals are gonna be talking about, you know, what you bring, how people respond to you, 
How do you engage with others? What are the impacts that you've had? And I'm not necessarily talking about the bottom line. You know, it doesn't have to be about the biggest deal that you've closed, but it could be about the way that you've mentored or you started a new organization at your, uh, you know, a new, a new club or a new um, talking group at your organization. So when you, when you describe someone and you think like to your friends, you're talking about who they are as a person, not just what they do for a living, right? Or, or she's the person that sits next to me is really not as interesting as she's into this. She's really thoughtful. She talks about her family a lot. She comes from this kind of background and she's really made it in, in, in important in her own life to give back to that community, right? So I think that when, you, when you're looking at a career vision, it's important not only to talk about what is that trajectory look like, but where do the things that are important to you come into play? So um, it, it should really be extant, not only in what you do, but how you express it, how other people express it about you. And then really going back to what Patty and Michelle and Pete actually have all talked about is things from your own life that are important and impactful. So we never would have known about that firefighter unless mm. Pete had really done some digging. We never would have understood why the young man that Matt and I had a couple of years ago really was compelled to talk about eradicating plastic bags from the ocean until we realized that he grew up in Miami and he was really, really disturbed about what he saw around him, right? We sort of, we all, and sometimes these things take some digging um, and, and take some iteration and kind of, and no one ever is going to tell you everything just in the beginning, right? You're, you're kind of getting surface level, but then as you take a deep breath and you get into this process, that's where the things that make you, you are going to come out. And, and that's how I see you know, chances are the career that you have out of undergrad is related to what you studied as an undergrad and is probably related to what the job market was doing at the time that you graduated, right? There are a lot of opportunities for this, this, and this. And so you interviewed at 10 companies and these are the two that gave you the best opportunity, you know, the, 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 the best offers. But I think that the second piece of your career, which is going to be starting throughout this process of applying to business school. And it could be even the third piece of your career. You know, I don't, I'm not sure exactly where everybody on this call is in their, in their career path, but this is the time that you get to imbue these next steps with what is incredibly important to you as an individual. So when Matt says, where do you shine? Um, that goes right back to why do you get out of bed in the morning? Um, and, and what is it, you know, I do one thing for a living. I do a lot of other things outside of my job. And they're kind of related to each other, but some of them I do because they bring me immense joy and satisfaction, not because I'm getting paid to do them. So right. these are the things that, that admissions officers, and I know it sounds crazy because a lot of folks will be like, why do they care about this stuff? Well, don't forget, every, all these schools are building communities. At Wharton, we built a community every year of 824 individuals. And how are they going to interact? What were their inputs and outputs going to be? And how, how are they ultimately going to come together as a class? So those are definitely the things that are in the mind of admissions officers as they're going through your profiles. Right. Now, um, I want to steer us community engagement, perhaps volunteer work. Uh, and Rukba, uh, again, filled in the Strat questionnaire. And thank you, Rukba. You, you took a lot of time. It was, it was absolutely fascinating to read through this. And any of the other viewers that haven't had yet the time to complete that questionnaire, please do because we would love to then offer you the chance of a one-on-one -on -one consultation, having gone through all of that information and have the sort of in-depth in uh, discussions about business school next steps, and obviously uh, your background and your accomplishments. Now, uh, Rukba is looking at two of the top uh, international uh, business schools, uh, INSEAD that describes itself as the business school for the world, uh, and London Business School, what is it, 70 nationalities, I think, in the M MBA program. Um, if, if I think about uh, middle school students in the US, they're perhaps already being encouraged to think about community service and volunteering, certainly as you get to high school, and it's get well, you're going to be putting in those college applications to UC Berkeley and UPenn and the University of Chicago. And it's a big piece. But that's not true all over the world. And you know, not everyone has been volunteering since the age of 14 or 15. Now, Pete, in, in Rugba's case, he had experience with the big four working at KPMG but has done some fascinating work 
uh, with uh, NGOs, uh, with a think tank. He came out of one of Mumbai's top schools, uh, St. Xavier's. And he shared with us that one of uh, you know, his, his most rewarding uh, accomplishments was to actually manage and push through a significant piece of government policy related to tourism in Uttar Pradesh. Now, that's the second biggest state in the country. So he hasn't shared, you know, volunteering at Big Brother, Big Sister or Habitat for Humanity or Teach for India. But embedded, it strikes me, in his background, there's something that's had, you know, enormous impact on society. You at Haas would have been just as happy to work with those sort of details to get the, the, the sense of values, uh, integrity and purpose of this individual. Absolutely. And I think it it highlights a facet of this that I think is important to remember that every applicant is an individual and brings to bear different experiences and strengths and areas for development. And it's not as formulaic as saying we look at this and say, oh, well, there he hasn't done big brothers and big sisters. Therefore, this person isn't community oriented. It's important to communicate what you have done and what your motivations were and what the impact of those things might have been. And from this information, it sounds like Rukpa would be a very interesting candidate for most business schools. It's an, it's an issue of uh, successfully communicating all of these wonderful things. And that's more difficult than it sounds. And I know some of you have probably already looked at your application questions and you think, oh my gosh, I have 250 words. What can I say in 250 words? So that goes to what I think Michelle said, or maybe Patty, excuse me. There are a variety of ways you can tease out these experiences and skills in your application, uh, not only through the very limited uh, real estate that you have in the essays. And so that's part of what I think we all spend a great deal of time working with our clients on. Mm, yeah. Now at Fortune, I think we have, what is it? 11, 12, 13 colleagues that were the head of admissions at London Business School, the director of admissions at INSEAD, and many others that were associate directors at those two schools. Perhaps one aspect that they would all emphasize is that very global mindset of these European business schools. And for Rukba, he didn't study in, in Europe. He didn't work uh, for KPMG in their Sao Paulo office in Brazil. So both career studies, have always had um, a, a sort of a domestic experience based out of India. Just a few words, Judith, perhaps on how he can then share with schools like INSEAD and LBS an international mindset, perhaps through the clients that he's worked with or, or, or some of these uh, think tank and NGO opportunities. I would agree 100 percent. You know, you're you're I'm, I'm assuming coming into contact with people cross border, cross country, figuring out how to engage with them in your home country. If you've, you've worked with NGOs, I'm assuming that there was outside funding or outside you know, uh, uh, individuals that were coming to, um, to, to work within the framework of your home state. So I would not be super concerned if you yourself had not been out of the country, um, because I think that there's lots of ways to talk about the global mindset, both of the employers that you've had and the work that you've done. In addition, the fact that you were involved with tourism policy for UP to me is really important because it shows that you have a mind that's very, very open, not only to your where you are physically, but that the other people that are that are coming in to, to, as visitors as well. So really, you know, to be able to show those synergies, I think is going to be really important less so is going to be that you physically have lived outside of India, but more so that you've engaged with individuals and you've managed communication, you've managed engagement, um, discussions, and again, not, and I apologize, not knowing the specifics of the work that you did at the think tank, but guessing that there's some examples within these organizations that you can pull on to reference in terms of internationalism. I know that in the gentlest of ways. Uh, we, we tease uh, our colleague Caroline, who was the director of admissions at INSEAD. She was there for seven years, and I think we, I estimated she probably had the final say on about 34,000 applicants to INSEAD's MBA program. And colleagues from London Business School, HBS, other schools that maybe have one essay and an optional essay, they look at INSEAD's application that has seven plus the video, and they're like, Caroline, 
what the hell were you thinking when you designed this NCAD application? It's a monster. And she says, well, you know, we really did want to give the candidate the chance to, to sort of share their pathway, their story. But that's not always the case. You've mentioned, you know, word limits of 250 words. So, Michelle, that brings me to the idea of what to include and what not, and that passion that you have for video. I see firefighting again, and I feel that for the Ignite program, there's clearly some metaphor at work. Um, but, you know, when you're working with clients, how do you help them to sift through all of those other passions and experiences and how they might be relevant for a career vision? Yeah, absolutely. I think Patty mentioned it, it you know, starting with the extracurriculars with our clients. There's, and I think that's why our strategy questionnaire, which I think most of you have completed or at least looked at, it, it's so comprehensive and we've developed it over the years to have a starting point to start those discussions. Because again, we want to learn as much as we can, every piece about you, your values, you know, your, your, you know, things that have, you know, really influenced you and what's relevant, like what you get excited about. Again, professionally, I think we'll probably have a clear understanding, your resume, your, your jobs, your trajectory, you know, et cetera. But I also am always really interested in what else that you enjoy doing. Again, some people have things that are very, you know, structured and some people love to walk dogs on the weekend, right? But again, it goes back to understand, understanding what that looks like and feels like for you. And you, I think we didn't have, maybe haven't talked about as much. And I know Patty has talked about like this self-development process, right? That we kind of take you through in order to really reflect to be able to understand what drives you, your motivations, to then bring to us, to bring to the application, to have the admissions committee get this real great sense of who you are. So what's relevant, I you're, we're gonna have those discussions and the things that really will stand out will be if sports, what does that mean and look like? If that's maybe just on the bottom of your resume, and um, you know what, you know that you follow sports, that you do fantasy football. And I know Jody Keating, who's our resume specialist and like the guru of resumes, she'll push you on. Tell me the name of the sports. Like we we will try to tease this out in any way possible and highlight it wherever we can. Um, mm -hmm. If it's the video games, is that you know just something again? Have you built a community there? What is again? Have you written a blog? Have you again started your own fantasy football league? Again, talk about leadership, like. But those are things that we really can discuss with you. And I know there's a lot of things that people, again, had maybe more time as an undergrad that they were able to pursue these passions. Maybe there's been a break, but ultimately, again, going back to our beginning of what gets you up in the morning, besides professionally, again, what you love doing and connecting with your community, with your family, with your friends and those attributes, we wanna help you, as Judah said, through the different parts of the application, really let it shine. Because that's as much as we can help all those little pieces shine in different areas and aspects, given the essays application that you are given. Um, that's what we are here to help you with and figure out. And it's, again, it's finding the right coach, I think, I believe that connects with you and that you feel like you can open up to and like with Pete that, that he really dug into and found the firefighter and, and wanted that to have those discussions. And he felt like maybe there's something there. Sometimes you don't see what we might see as a theme or something that might be interesting. And we help maybe pull that out or at least have those discussions. Is, is this a thread that maybe you would like to highlight? Are you comfortable is, you know, so I think that's what we're here to help you kind of come to those realizations or at least have that, that discussion and that thought process of, you know, what, what do I really do still love to do or what have I always been drawn to problem solving? mentor, I mean, right, mentoring younger kids, you know, a lot of people like to pay it forward. Like, we don't want to use those words, but I mean, what does that mean to you? Who was that person that did that for you that was so impactful that you therefore feel this? I really also want to be that person that can go back and help X, Y, and Z, right? Do do this in this area. Right. And, and Peter, I don't want to have our viewers overthinking and saying, well, you know, I, I do long distance running or I do triathlons. It's a fairly individual pursuit versus dragon boat racing or other things that you might do uh, in, in, in a big team. I mean, you're not saying we don't take marathon runners, but we do take uh, collective team sport players. But again, it, it's sort of digging a little bit and finding out what the underlying passion might be. So, so uh, here's Cristiano. Um, the scientist, why, why scientist? Let me remind myself. Yeah, so he was at the um, at University of New Mexico, a, a medical lab scientist, and has worked at Gauss Surgical, Quest Diagnostics, 
uh, looking at uh, sort of uh, a number of the top 10, top 15 uh, schools. Um, and I think with Christiana, a lot of the extracurriculars. So Pete, as, as you would see someone, treasurer of the Latino professionals of America, uh, the John Hopkins Consulting Club, uh, volunteer work in a health clinic. So certainly that, that healthcare uh, and life sciences theme. Again, from something that Patty said earlier, would you be looking at all of this and singing, He's, these are maybe the demonstrations of what Cristiano will bring to our business school community? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I can see the threads woven through this profile. For example, if, you know, uh, Cristiano has worked in surgical sales, he's worked as a medical lab scientist. I'd love to know how that connects to the passion that led him to be a volunteer at Casa de Salud. I mean, I think there is probably a very rich story here that could be conveyed in an application about what drives his interest and um, how he's going to use his post MBA career goal, how that will incorporate these interests and how he will move his career forward. I think there are probably a lot of rich threads that we could mine in this profile and really thinking about also how some of these have both prepared Cristiano to uh, add to his MBA class, but also how do these experiences and skills help prepare you for the ultimate career you want to have in consulting? What are you going to bring to consulting that is that is purely you and is different from many other candidates who might be pursuing this career path. Yeah, yeah. So uh, MBB, uh, join the line. And of course, working at those firms, it's possible uh, that you could be working on an oil and gas project uh, for, for six months, and then they move you to a fintech project. So would, would you encourage Cristiano, Pete, to sort of explore within uh, if it's healthcare, biotech, sort of the life sciences space, is, is that going to resonate if he's bringing that background with him rather than say, I just want to be a general consultant? Yes, um, because I think, and this is a kind of a nuanced discussion because, uh, and of course, I don't exactly know what Cristiano's goal is in consulting, but um, that is a good way into this because uh, all of those firms, you know, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, have specialized practices in specific areas that relate to healthcare, for example. And if that happens to be the interest, I think it's great to talk about that. It might also be a strategy if uh, Cristiano is wanting to move in a different direction to say, you know, here are the things I've done and I'm wanting to move my career in this direction because X. And for that reason, um, I am looking at, uh, I don't know, uh, BCG's work in yet a different field. But I think connecting your passion, your skills, and the career goal together and telling a coherent story, not a fake story, but a coherent real story about what that transition is, is always interesting to admissions officers. And I think... Um, Sometimes people worry. I think we had a discussion about this the other day, um, Matt, uh, that some people think, well, everybody wants to be a consultant. And so my application is going to be boring. Maybe I better say something else because too many other people want to do it. Uh, I, I advise people not to worry about that. I think if you're really pulling out your unique interests and abilities, you're going to present an interesting application, even if there are a lot of other people wanting to be consultants for the MBB firms. Right. I, a couple of years ago, one of the deans of the top schools sat down with students and said, hey, you know, you, you don't all need to um, become entrepreneurs as you come out of the program. You know, for many, consulting is a fantastic way to consolidate the year or two year uh, MBA experience. And Patty, that brings us uh, to the idea of uh, you know, positions as you come out of business, business school, and obviously there's a focus on that and how you're going to repay your student loans, but also a long-term vision uh, for your career. So talk us through, again, as you were looking through the lens of Booth or from Stanford, you know, what that immediate goal upon graduation, but how they're also then sharing um, the second, the third role, that longer-term position, and maybe also considering how much 
time they should spend on the long term when perhaps it's more speculative? Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think the bottom line here is short term versus long term, just to put it into how I, how a lot of people define it. The short term is, is as you said, maybe immediate post MBA. Um, and really should be uh, maybe a series, a, a stepping stone or stepping stones to that longer term vision. So the short term should be achievable and realistic. Um, it can include, you know, a potential job title, a company name, a sector. Um, some of my clients, I encourage them to say something like, I want to be X at companies like X, Y, and Z. So being, you know, specific and it shows the ad com that they've thought through how to get to that longer term vision, you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. So the short term is more immediate, obvious. Um, the long term, I like to encourage people to start out thinking boldly, right? Especially on a Stanford application. Be bold. Let's think about what that looks like. And then we'll kind of reverse, might reverse engineer that into the short term goals. So um, really thinking about short term as the stepping stones toward this long term career vision. Um, and we we often you know get into great conversations, or I do with clients. It's it's really a, a nice exercise in thinking about career vision and short term versus long term. And then also you know it's important to think about plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, one of the the great things about uh, Fortuna is that the number of tools that we can use with our clients. So we, we encourage them, we encourage our clients to, to think about one of the questions on the strategy questionnaire is, if you don't get into business school this year, you know, what are you gonna do? Like, what's, what's, your, you know, what's your plan B? Um, and also, you, know, you might have you know, Stanford and Harvard as your, as your, your main um, target schools, but what about, plan, what about if you don't get into either of those schools? What's plan B? What's plan C? Um, so really, I try to encourage people to think, you know, more, more broadly. Um, so uh, and we have great tools that we can use, which I, I just keep coming back to, for the tools that we can use with our clients. I mean, Patty, just to reflect, you're an associate dean at Chicago Booth, Adcoms at Stanford. You talk about you know, being bold uh, in, in what you might share. Um, Stanford is an interesting example where they get stung in the US news ranking every year because um, three months after graduation, over 68, 69% have uh, accepted a, a position. But in adcoms, did you actually sort of second guess and say, you know, I, I just need to make sure that everyone's going to get a job three months out? Or you ran with it and said, you know, what works for this candidate? That's what we want to see. Right. I think it's a, it's a, collaborative effort, again, getting back to working with our um, career services colleagues in sort of a, a collaborative effort. Of course, we look at each individual, uh, but we're also looking at, can the school help those individuals? You know, we want to be successful as a, as a business school. Um, so we want to be realistic. We want to bring people in who add to the community, but also have a realistic goal, achievable goals that we, and, and that we can help. We can help mm. them find that that job. Um, mm. So it's a little bit of both. It's you know doing right by the individual, but also doing right by the broader community at the business school. Right. So this is our last profile. Uh, Corinna from Canada uh, feels somehow poetic, who uh, came out of the University of Alberta uh, a couple of years ago. And, and, and Judith, I'm going to turn to you for, for Corinna's profile. She'd already got a couple of years at Deloitte. And right there, I want to be x role at y company well she's got y and z right so she's a tech product manager at google or amazon uh, with an engineering stem uh, background uh, maybe a little bit of work uh, on the gre if she's going to um, be truly competitive at some of those top 10 uh, us schools and lots of fascinating extracurriculars and, and volunteer work so again judith as you were sitting down with your team at wharton someone perhaps being that specific and it wasn't even just product manager right it's, uh, the tech product manager how would you assess uh Corinna's career vision so I would say that she's really compelling in terms of if you look at her background what she's been doing and how she's coming out of mechanical engineering carbon code certainly really interesting to me 
the way I would phrase the post MBA career goals might say, for example, as a tech product manager at Google or Amazon, right? So there's lots of different ways to spin this. Um, and I know I was joking earlier that Michelle always says, give them, you know, two, two companies that you would want to work for. Um, so I like this, how direct this is, but I also want to frame it so that it's given as an opportunity for this is one thing I'm thinking about, right? So you, you want to be clear. She's obviously done her research. You know, she knows, she knows enough about tech product to know that that's where she wants to, what she wants to be doing and where she wants to be doing it. Um, I just, I, I would probably help her to write that sentence so that it doesn't say, <clears throat> and if that doesn't happen, I'm forget it. Like I'm never going to have a job, right? You want to make sure that it's viable, which in this case, I believe that it is, um, but that there's also some opportunity for her to have some other things happen to her within the framework of the MBA program. Um, but the fact that she's already been in consulting, I also find really compelling because it shows that she's had exposure to a breadth of opportunity um, in terms of industry. I, I, I like this, I like this, um, this profile quite a bit and I like the specificity. I would probably lean in a little bit on the way that it's presented. Um, Pete, uh, full disclosure, I must share with you that my goals for going to business school, I want to make so much money. Yeah, I, a bit like Jeff Bezos spending, what was it, half a billion on the front of his ship and it's some sculpture that these billionaires just don't know how to spend it. Um, that is the goal. You know, that is the honest, driven ambition of some candidates and others want to save the world. I'm polarizing the debate. But, you know, being honest with business schools, in fact, when we were discussing for this session, you talked about both digging deeper, but also being prepared to show some vulnerability in this whole process and the authenticity that would perhaps then come across to you and your team. Absolutely, because I think sometimes it's, uh, I've talked to clients who have a really big ambitious, uh, big ambition of something they want to do and they think, well, that's gonna sound really out there. So I'm going to tell them that I wanna be a banker. And two things happen, I think, when you do that. One is that, your essay about why you want to be a banker is going to be really flat because the truth mm -hmm. is you don't want to be a banker. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to something we mentioned earlier, trying to say what you think the admissions committee wants to hear is not usually a good strategy. So um, I think the vulnerability comes in sometimes if you have a, a big audacious goal and you know it's going to be hard to, to achieve, I think it's sometimes okay to say, I know that this is gonna be a really difficult thing to accomplish and here are the ways I'm gonna to try to do that. But I'm also aware that, you know, there are other things that I'm, that I'm interested in. It's okay to uh, acknowledge that you're trying to do something big and it's not a guaranteed outcome. I also think it's okay in some sense to say that, you're not sure what you want to do. Now, there's a caveat to that. Um, business schools don't like someone who comes in and says, I have no idea what I want to do and I'm going to discover myself in the next two years. That is a not, that is a not a successful strategy. Um, but you might express your interest. Okay, I want to work in uh, an NGO that's focused on uh, climate sustainability. And, and you might know, you might not know exactly what organization that is. You'll want, you'll need to be able to talk about the passion that you have and about your goals for having an impact. But it's fine to say that might be organization X doing this. Another option would be organization Y doing that. Um, and part of that answer could be, I'm going to have the opportunity during business school to test out these options and find the one that that's perfect for me. That's okay. And I think sometimes candidates are afraid to show any vulnerability or uncertainty. Mm. And I don't think that's necessarily a good strategy, but I'd love to hear uh, what our colleagues well, think. I'm going to turn to Patty because, <clears throat> Patty, the, the last time I woke up in the month of November, and felt that the world had shifted 
we have to go back to 2016 and a US presidential election. What the hell just happened? <laughs> now, if we go back to November 2022, I think probably you know 30 days of the year, I was blissfully unaware that OpenAI had launched something called ChatGPT3. It's hard to imagine six months later because it feels like it's all we've been talking about. But you know, we're talking about how AI and GPT is fundamentally going to you know, change the future of work. Uh, Goldman Sachs is even putting numbers on it. The idea that business school will help to future-proof your career as you think about machine learning, as you think about AI and all of these other characteristics of adaptability, uh, resilience, you know, the analytical skills, everything else that you'll pick up. So if, if someone says, you know, like the rest of us, I don't know where AI is going, but, you know, business school is going to help me perhaps to, to get a better sense and shape the next steps of career. Is that level of honesty uh, welcome to the admissions office? Absolutely. I think so. Uh, sitting on an admissions committee, I'm looking at um, individuals who are open, who are agile, who are open to, to change, right? It's constant change in the world. Um, and I think you know, being open to that and learning during the two years of business school is absolutely crucial in the candidate. Um, so, you know, that's honest. No one has a crystal ball. Mm. Um, but, you know, being able to think about that and being kind of com sort of comfortable in that uncertainty is, is really important to, to communicate. Um, yeah. especially these days. I mean, you just gave that that six-year, just think about all of the change that has happened. Um, and being able to acknowledge that in an application as an MBA candidate is, is absolutely um, crucial in my mind. So uh, as we're wrapping up, um, Michelle, you talked, we talked earlier about uh, Los Angeles and industries on the West Coast. We talked about uh, New York and how career goals can align with a school culture, perhaps core strengths, just, just talk us through some of the different ways that that role in company X or Y, that you're all pushing our Ignite to, uh, clients to, to, to generate, and how that then fits in with the school itself. Yeah, I, I think you're, one of your top you know, assignments, again, is going to be, to I, I mentioned before, outreach and research of the schools, and really understanding what their offerings are and how you will optimize those given your career goals and what you're hoping and looking to get out of business school, right? It's, it's a two-year investment, but ultimately, as Warren likes to say, a lifelong learning investment, right? As an alum, you know, et cetera. So really, you know, the location, I have clients that are like, I definitely don't want to go to this city. And I'm like, I hear you because of their reasons. Okay. So like locations is one thing that you can think about and either you're open to or not, but it's also the culture. Like we've talked about, you know, Wharton collaboration, the, how you work in teams, you're in a learning team, a cohort, um, you know, the, the, also let's say a booth, the flexible curriculum, again, curriculum wise, the offerings, the professors, the electives, the tracks you can, you can go, you can be beyond, you know, if you're interested in Wharton, the healthcare management program, again, really understanding what that school's offering you and how it will benefit you and, and getting to your career goals, both in terms of soft skills, you know, um, hard skills, the knowledge, you know, this is my toolkit. This is what I'm missing. This is why I'm going to business school. So having that understanding and then going and looking at each of these schools and obviously the network, as we've talked about the community while you're there, your, your classmates that you're surrounded by, but also the broader network, again, once you leave, but also while you're there, these, these, all of these schools have, you get the opportunity to have speakers come in that, that are alums. You have, you know, entrepreneur in residence programs that, that they mentor current students, you know, as alums. So really understanding, again, what you are looking, it's a huge investment and it's gonna be a transformational experience, but what that school is offering to you specifically and how it's you know, ultimately gonna benefit you and your ability to achieve 
your career goals and vision is, is the key piece to all of this, right? So I think us as coaches, we have a lot of knowledge and we talk this through with our clients, but I, I always really, now that we are back, not just in a virtual world, but that you can go and attend information sessions or reach out. A lot of the, the schools really um, you know, give you the contact information of clubs, students, you know, admissions officers, to really, you know, dig into what they are offering. So you can really show that it's very important to them in the applications, essays, that you understand the value of their school and how you will benefit from it. Right. I know you've worked with many uh, Wharton applicants with uh, this fantastic HCM program they have in healthcare, but the Lauder Institute and the international dimension yeah. that someone might want to bring uh, to their careers. Now, in the case of Marcus, Marcus and I are going to set up a call so that we can talk through your background and, and look at those career goals as you want to make a move to public sector consulting. That's a promise that we're making to everybody uh, that has been involved in this uh, Ignite session. Um, but I just want to end on one note. <clears throat> Patty, I've been working really hard in the last few years. Uh, through my studies, no, not, not so much, but I've been trying to play catch up. Uh, ever since. And here I get the chance to apply to business school. And whether it's Booth, the GSB, Wharton, Haas, Harvard Business School, INSEAD, LBS, you hold up this mirror to me and say, what do you want to do with your life? That's quite a gift, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about, you know, what we do at Fortuna, we talk about MBA admissions consulting, it, which sounds very transactional. We are going to work with our clients to submit, you know, the best possible application to school X, Y, and Z. That to me is transactional, but but what we really do is this is about self-development for our clients. And I like to think of it as portable work, meaning it's something that, you know, we give our clients the gift of self-reflection and thinking about what they want to do during our time as consultants with them. But that's something that stays with them. So the work that we do together, the things that we uncover, the things our clients write down and discover about themselves, they take that with them long past their business school application um, into their careers and can even reflect back, you know, many years into the future. So this is something that is about a, it's about a personal journey uh, not to get too touchy feely, um, but it's about self development. It isn't just about submitting that that application, um, and it's really one of the things that I enjoy the, the most about this kind of work is really getting to know a client and and being able to help them not just with a B school application, but with what they want to what they want to do with their lives, what kind of impact they want to make in the world. Yeah, the, the, the cherry on top of, of this cake, because, of course, our, our clients at Fortuna have tremendous success when you look at you know the schools that are applying to and the offers that they get the scholarships on top of that. And and just to think that they also come back to us and say, actually, yeah, I, I got my offer and I'm really excited to go to business school. But I just enjoyed this process working with you. Uh, Judith, you've often said, you know, imagine that your your retirement due. You know, what would you want people to be saying uh, about you? And there's that sense, right? It, it starts right here and, and these steps on, on the admissions journey to business school. And uh, we are so excited about the upcoming opportunities that we have available, um, where this was a session that we presented because we really wanted you guys to understand what Ignite is all about. It is a great way to get out of the gate it's six sessions, so that's not a huge commitment. Um, and we are starting a group in a couple of weeks, actually next week. How is it the end of May already? Actually, the, 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 the one that begin is already fully booked. Yes. So okay. I think that's the next why. One is in the middle of June. Um, and and as, I, as I've, I think I've repeated myself on this one, um, for those of you that have completed those strategy questionnaires, uh, and for the rest of you, you have that link. It's 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 not a document that you just fill in 20 minutes, right? I mean, it really um, encourages the level of introspection and self-reflection that all of you have talked about. But a great starting point for us you know, to sit down with you uh, and share those goals together and the Ignite program. And of course, all of the extraordinary coaching uh, that Michelle, that Patty, that Pete, uh, and that Judith bring to the Fortuna Dream Team. 
So thank you for sharing this uh, Ignite uh, preview session. Of course, in those six live sessions, small groups, so that we're actually exchanging and, and pushing you and saying, tell me more about this. In fact, I'm convinced that Michelle will have all of you with Company X in this sector by the time she's through with you. Um, but thank you uh, to my four wonderful colleagues. This was uh, such fun to share together. Thanks to all of you that have joined us uh, and, and reach out for your next steps. Thanks very much.